I am really proud to introduce our young alumni keynote for this afternoon. Uh, it's Andrew White. Um, so Andrew is a, oh, hello. <laughs> Andrew's a good friend of mine, um, so I'm really excited to introduce him. Um, so Andrew currently works at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory as an energy equity and environmental justice systems researcher. His work focuses on working with community groups to co-develop resiliency-based approaches to evaluate and improve local energy systems within marginalized communities. Um, he strives to ensure that there is institutional representation of community-driven, bottom-up approaches to energy equity in the energy system and in decision-making processes. Um, so that's what Drew does now. Um, as I said, he's a Georgia Tech alum as well. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering uh, where he focused on environmental and water systems. Uh, while at Georgia Tech, uh, Drew was a Stamps Presidential Scholar. He served as a Georgia Tech Energy on the Hill Fellow in DC, uh, which was funded through a fellowship with the Strategic Energy Institute. And he also worked as a research assistant for both the Strategic Energy Institute and the Brooke Byers um, Institute for Sustainable Systems. So after Georgia Tech, um, a bit later, uh, Drew also pursued a master's degree in political ecology um, at, Lanca at Lancaster University in the UK as a Fulbright Scholar. And his master's research was kind of focused on the investigation of infrastructure development in Jamaica and its impact on local communities. Um, so I could talk about a lot more achievements and interesting projects that uh, Drew worked on. Um, his resume is definitely stacked, but um, I won't take up the whole hour doing that. Um, I will say, like I said, Drew is a good friend of mine and I've known him for a long time. We both did our undergrad uh, here at Georgia Tech together. Um, a while ago, and we actually both did uh, our postgraduate work in the UK kind of around the same time. Um, so the reason I asked him to come speak today is twofold. The first reason is this idea of interdisciplinarity, something that we know is really, really important as re researchers now, and it's not just about working with people from other disciplines, even though that's super important, but it's also having a more interdisciplinary mindset ourselves. And so like I said, Drew has this engineering degree. He also has like a social science, political ecology degree. And the way that these two things come together in his work now is really interesting. We've had a lot of coffee conversations about it. So it's something that I was interested to have him reflect on today. And the second reason is kind of what we talked about in the last session um, because of the work he now does with communities. And it's really important because the work Drew does is really focused on walking side by side with communities. It's about not just taking these technologies and dumping them you know, place to place to place. It's about understanding the local community, understanding the place, the local culture, and understanding what things work there and what, how he can support clean energy transitions that are very context specific and place specific. Um, so I think we'll learn a lot from Drew's reflections in those areas. And um, yeah, the third reason is just because, like I said, he's a good friend of mine. I'm really proud of him and I'm really excited to hear <laughs> about what he talks about. So with that, I will pass the mic. Oh, am I, I have, have one? Mic, yeah. yeah, I think so. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much for that very thorough <laughs> introduction, Nicole. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really honored and excited to be here today giving the Young Alumni keynote presentation. Um, throughout my time and well after, I learned quite a bit about myself and some of the energy and environmental grand challenges that we face as a society. Uh, my hope and my plan today is to share some of those learnings with you all and how I apply them in my work across, the en across energy infrastructure systems. So before we dive into the content, um, just a little bit about my presentation structure. Um, we're going to be weaving in and out of key reflections from my personal experiences and current projects that I work on. Um, as an energy equity and environmental justice researcher at PNNL. Um, additionally, a few of these slides I present will include links to learn more about some of the work that I contribute to. Um, so feel free to visit these during or after the presentation. Next, if there's something that I speed through that you don't get the chance to catch, you know, be sure to ask me about it at the end. Um, and connected to that, I'd enjoy the opportunity to turn this presentation into more of a discussion. So I'm gonna try and get through like the slides as much as possible, as quickly as possible, so that way you all can ask me more questions about the things that you're interested in. 
So uh, this slide just provides a brief summary of those key learnings that I mentioned um, that I'll be diving deeper into as we go throughout the presentation. The general themes of these learnings are having a mentality of interdisciplinarity, complicating the problem versus diving straight into exploring solutions, understanding the consequences of infrastructure, and what partnerships mean to adjust clean energy transition and achieving equitable outcomes. Um, so Triple EJ, as I call it, or energy equity and environmental justice concepts and applications span all aspects of our energy system. How we generate energy, how we consume it as heat and electricity, and how we dispose of infrastructure systems at the end of their life cycle. The applications of these learnings that I'll be sharing today um, go across the electric grid, and I'll be sharing just a few examples of how Triple EJ shows up in different technology areas, including watersheds and hydropower, building technologies, energy storage, and distributed wind. So as Nicole mentioned during that lovely introduction, um, I have an interdisciplinary interdisciplinary background, um, a STEM degree in civil and environmental engineering, and a social science degree in a subject called political ecology. At first, these two fields might seem disparate, um, but through my experience, they're in deep and meaningful conversation with one another. During my time at Tech, um, I explored so many engineering disciplines, but I landed on civil and environmental engineering discipline, uh, civil and environmental engineering, because I've always been fascinated by big and small infrastructure systems and how they serve people. I understood um, CEE, for short, to be the engineering discipline most concerned with public good. Um, developing infrastructure systems at the section at the intersection of the built and the natural environment with the intention of being explicitly for communities and people. Um, and in alignment with the spirit of this sentiment, CEE was my introduction to sustainability and the sustainable development goals. Um, but I found myself longing for a more academic critical engagement with sustainability that wasn't fully captured and understood by engineering as a discipline. And that's how I found my way to political ecology and my first key reflection of having a mentality of interdisciplinarity. So um, this is gonna be one of the, the things that I talked to th today that has a lot on um, the slide, but I'm gonna try and highlight the, the key parts. Um, and so what I mean when I say by a, a mentality of interdisciplinarity is that navigating this path, career path towards Triple EJ has required more than just technical approaches of models, metrics, and math tools provided to me in my engineering training. Um, I've learned that achieving equitable outcomes and a just clean energy transition um, requires something more of me as an engineer. Um, and so for me, that meant also becoming a political ecologist. Political ecology is an interdisciplinary field that takes up the burden of understanding the relationship between human systems and environmental systems, how they interact, shape, and influence each other. Um, one of the first things I learned while studying political ecology was that there are multiple frameworks and approaches to sustainable development with varying levels of impact on human systems and environmental conditions. Um, and so this is my first introduction to the concepts of environmental justice. And so as you can see here, um, there are a lot of different approaches within this larger paradigm of sustainable development. Um, but as you can see, not every approach moves the needle um, as you go to the right on this x-axis here of increasing environmental concerns. Not every ap approach moves that needle on socioeconomic equity. And so in learning about these approaches, I came across environmental justice as a theory and a concept and a, and a field to study. So in learning about justice, I, I learned more about the justice movements and how justice movements were social movements that started in low income black and, black and brown communities um, concerned with uh, their environmental conditions. Um, and so these justice movements have contributed key tenets that we can use as a framework to evaluate the equity and justice considerations of energy, climate, and environmental systems. Um, these, these three key tenets, as I learned them, are distributive justice, procedural justice, and um, recognition-based justice. 
And so distributive justice is essentially concerned with what the benefits and burdens are of infrastructure systems and how they, how they are, not to use the, the word in the definition, but how they're um, distributed, what's another word for distributed? How they're allocated, um, how they're allocated across uh, different groups of people. Uh, procedural justice is concerned with understanding how fair processes are, whether they're inclusionary or uh, exclusionary, um, whether or not people have all the same access to all the same information, um, and they're concerned with the processes that that um, govern infrastructure systems. And then recognition-based justice is really concerned um, with understanding who the marginalized groups are and how they're marginalized. If there are ways of knowing and being and existing in the world um, that get pushed away from the center. So thinking about, um, again, going back to that prior slide with all the different sustainable development pro approaches, thinking about how traditionally um, indigenous knowledge or indigenous pro approaches may be marginalized or pushed away from the center um, compared to more modern Euro-Western approaches to sustainable development. So the first project that I'll be talking about today um, is called The Roadmap to Developing Intelligent Watersheds for Hydropower. Um, so our team has come up with this definition that an intelligent watershed is an interconnected information system that spans a variety of processes and subsystems. And the goal of an intelligent watershed is to link data to decisions across varying spatial and temporal scales that are relevant to the operations and planning at the watershed scale. Um, this project is important to me and impactful because we've gotten the opportunity to explore how energy systems are intimately and inextricably linked with water systems. And we've started to understand through conversations that we've had with community-based organizations, watershed coalitions, and other researchers, we've started unraveling what the key equity considerations are in developing intelligent watersheds. Um, and so from using this, this framework, it's gonna be something that we kind of revisit throughout the presentation. Um, using this framework of the Triple EJ tenants, we start to understand um, that in order to develop an, an intelligent watershed from uh, an, a distributive justice perspective is aligning the, the connection um, or the condition of a watershed to what the benefits of the watershed are and who those benefits go to. Um, from a procedural standpoint, understanding that watersheds are really complex things um, and that key decision makers um, make decisions for watersheds that often um, don't share power with uh, the communities who are affected by those decisions. Um, and then again, speaking back to, in, in the spirit of recognition-based justice and speaking back to that earlier diagram that had the sustainable development approach of um, indigenous knowledge, we're starting to understand that there's not one way to, to know and understand water and that there are different ways to value water. And so I, by no means am, am I an indigenous scholar, um, nor do I have an indigenous background, but um, there's lots of literature out there that I would highly suggest that you folks go read and engage with. But some of the things that, that I've read or that I've come across in that literature um, is understanding how um, indigenous, approach, indigenous knowledge and approaches can start to break down this very rigid barrier that we traditionally have in Euro-Western societies of um, breaking down that barrier between nature and society and understanding the different water that value can have, um, not just economically and as a utility and as a resource to be exploited, but what it means to people and how it can be something that's valued socially and culturally um, as well. So um, the next thing that I'm going to talk about here is how having a mentality of interdisciplinarity has taught me what it means, what it means to me and for me to be an engineer, um, because it's some, and that it's sometimes more important to complicate the problem and the approach than to deliver a solution cheaply and quickly, which is often heralded in engineering. 
Um, and this brings me to something that I've always struggled with um, since my time studying at tech and studying engineering, um, is being called you know, the ultimate problem solver. Um, I've always been cautious and hesitant to revere myself as an engineer or a problem solver um, because I, I think that comes with so much power and so much responsibility that I don't know if we're also taught that in our, in our education, in our engineering education. Um, and what I've learned um, in some of the problems that I face in, in my work is that approaching these problems and developing solutions to these problems extend way beyond what we learn in an engineering classroom. Um, and so to my earlier point, what I mean by complicating the question is usually asking more questions to get at the root and systemic causes of energy and environmental issues so as not to produce a solution that only solves a superficial problem or an aspect of the problem while, perpetu while perpetuating systemic burdens and harms of the business as usual approaches. Um, and that brings me to this sort of text heavy slide because um, I just wanted to provide examples of the questions that I usually ask myself when I'm engaging and, I'm, and, and when I'm approaching my research. Um, and how I start to mobilize and operationalize um, these concepts of distributive justice, procedural justice, and justice as recognition um, in my research. So um, there are evaluative ways to ask these questions, like things that get at observations and understanding um, through data what the current situation is. And then there are sort of normative ways of asking these questions of what's the intent to improve the injustice or to mitigate the injustice, to remedy the injustice. Um, and so examples of these questions from like a distributive justice perspective are, you know, what and where are the injustices? But then a normative question is, is you know, how should these inequities be addressed? Like, what should the solution to the inequity be? Um, and so, lost in my notes here, but I can just talk about this slide. Um, this uh, diagram is something that I refer to often in my work when I start thinking about um, what are ways in which complicating the question um, instead of trying to approach a, a cheap and fast solution um, is really helpful. And so the, the example that comes to mind is, is um, I find this to be helpful when thinking about decarbonization as more than a techno-economic environmental problem. So looking at climate change as strictly a scientific issue leads to leads to an ahistorical, asocial, and apolitical contextualization um, that treats decarbonization as strictly, as strictly a techno-economic problem. So without critical scholarship like decolonial thinking and approaches that, again, sort of come from my background in political ecology, um, a technical decarbonization solution leads to more extractive economies that pull rare earth metals um, from the earth for technologies like solar panels um, and sort of just offsets extraction from fossil fuels to rare earth metals. And then what we have is, is that uh, we have communities, a part of the global majority, that are still being marginalized by go global capital flows um, instead of being actively incorporated into global systems and processes and being a part of the clean energy transition. And so that's sort of the delineation between a clean energy transition and a just clean energy transition. Um, and so yeah, justice-oriented pathway lends itself to approaches and solutions that not only keep carbon out of the atmosphere, but also don't perpetuate and continue that feedback loop of historical harms that just offset one set of problems for another. So, okay, going into another project that I work on. Um, this next project um, is interested in equitable decarbonization through residential buildings and homes in marginalized communities. Uh, this project is concerned with how tenants of is concerned with tenets of distributive justice, so understanding the benefits um, 
of clean energy and energy efficient technologies in homes and how those can reach low income black and brown communities. Um, we're also interested in concepts of procedural justice as well um, in reducing the barriers that disadvantaged communities face in participating in the clean energy transition, such as lack of information um, or policy processes to get funding um, for programs like WAP or LIHEAP, um, WAP being something that, uh, a program that the last panel talked about where you know they get millions of dollars of funds from the federal level going to the state level, and sometimes those funds get unallocated and don't reach folks who could actually be using those funds um, to access the benefits of clean and energy efficient technology like heat pumps, HVAC heat pumps, or heat pump water heaters, um, or putting solar panels on their house to offset their energy bills. Um, and so, um, this project is important to me because it, it takes place in Houston, um, and Houston um, is very similar to Atlanta. Um, one thing I probably haven't mentioned is that I'm from Atlanta, I grew up in Atlanta, um, and so being in this project um, has taught me ways that I can bring some of the research that I do in my job back to my own community um, here at home. Okay, so speaking of research in communities that I have connections to, that brings me to the research that I did for my master's program in Fulbright um, in Jamaica. So another fun fact about me, because looks like I'm just sharing now, um, <laughs> is that I'm a first generation Jamaican American. So um, yeah, yeah, so first, first generation of my family to be born here in America. Um, the generation above me, my mom's generation, um, were the first generation to emigrate from Jamaica here to the US. Um, and so, so much of my identity and who I am is connected to my Jamaican heritage and Jamaican culture. Um, because of these connections, um, I chose to focus my research on Jamaica, I, I chose to focus my master's and my Fulbright research um, on Jamaica's largest infrastructure project to date, um, Jamaica's North-South Highway, um, or JNSH for short. Um, in August of 2022, I conducted field work into understanding the impacts that um, this, transpor this transportation infrastructure project had on local communities. And through that experience, I started to learn how to interrogate infrastructure with the intent of understanding its more than engineering and more than technical impacts and consequences. Um, and so this brings me to my third key learning and perspective, and that's that infrastructure and technology solutions, um, including those for energy and the environment, are social and political and cultural, and therefore can marginalize communities or empower communities um, along those same social, economic, political, and cultural dimensions. Um, so I guess, yeah, taking more time to, to talk a little bit about uh, this project and this field work, um, it was uh, really an opportunity for my paradigm to shift, especially having a background in civil engineering, which involves things like bridges and, and roads um, and understanding how so much more can go into a civil engineering or an infrastructure project than just making sure that the grading is right or making sure that it's technically feasible or making sure that it's um, able to be financed and constructed. Um, when this project is talked about um, at the national and international level and the local level, um, there's a lot of discourse around how it is a huge success for Jamaica um, because it is the first highway that connects the urban center of Kingston on the south coast to the economic tourist hub of Ocho Rios on the north coast. Um, but what I think was missing and what I wanted to add um, was a sort of inverted critical assessment that spoke to, okay, what are the bottom-up perspectives? What are the on-the-ground perspectives of this infrastructure project? And how is it actually reconfiguring the way that people move across the island, understand their experiences on the island? Um, how is it affecting, you know, their day-to-day -day, um, and, you know, the economy of 
all the small rural communities that exist along the way um, of the highway. And so that's how I came to learn about this community called Faith's Pen, um, which is really, really famous in Jamaica um, for being sort of a global hub of where the, the tradition of um, cooking and eating jerk chicken um, is based. And so Faith's Pen used to be um, this place along the old road um, that, you know, if you were traveling from the South Coast to the North Coast, like you would stop there. Um, it was something that was a given. Um, but with the development of the highway um, in the Jamaican context, and as we have so many examples of in the American context, um, the highway now completely bypasses that small rural community. Um, and uh, it, it's complex because the highway also has a toll that you need to pay in order to use it. Um, so there are still lots of people that take the old road, but what we found is, is that the people with the disposable income um, that would spend the most money in these communities driving through them are now taking the highway um, and that disposable income is no longer um, benefiting the rural communities like Faith's Pen um, along the highway. And so, yeah, like I, uh, just, like, like I mentioned earlier, just reiterating, like this experience um, started to teach me how to approach infrastructure planning and engage with infrastructure in a more critical way of understanding like more than just the technical aspects of infrastructure um, and understanding the way that infrastructure can reconfigure cultures and geographies um, and relationships that, that people have with their communities. So um, another project that I work on at PNNL um, that some of you are familiar with is called Energy Stores for Social Equity. Um, and this is one of the flagship projects that I work on and understand um, to be infrastructure that has the power to empower. Um, and so ESC, ES4C um, involves partnering with 14 communities across the country to develop energy storage projects um, to meet community goals for their energy systems. Um, ES4C has been one of my favorite projects to work on because it's involved the most direct community work. Um, it's connected me to folks like Dr. E at IECA um, to start understanding how Triple EJ research, um, again, thinking about, okay, where I sit as a researcher and the power and the privilege that I have as a researcher that has an engineering background, um, how that research can start to be used to bridge the gap between community goals and desires for their energy systems um, and energy infrastructure, energy infrastructure planning. Um, so what's special about this program um, is that it empowers communities that have been historically marginalized by their energy systems through burdens such as frequency and duration of outages um, and burdens that are compounded by lack of investment and upgrades in energy infrastructure. Um, and it starts to turn, or it starts to help empower those communities to be energy system proponents. So key decision makers um, in how their infrastructure, how their energy infrastructure is designed and implemented and where the benefits go. Um, okay. So this brings me to my final key learning and reflection. Um, good infrastructure and technology solutions require partnering with communities, require partnering with the communities that they impact to co-develop approaches and ensure equitable outcomes. Um, this slide includes findings from an energy justice study um, that I like to reference a lot in my work and revisit a lot in my work of how communities and the organizations that represent them um, envision a just clean energy transition. And so some of the key findings from this study that I applied to my work are that it's imperative to integrate local knowledge into energy infrastructure decision making and budgeting processes. And that in addition to pursuing, and, I, and that in addition to this, um, it's also critical to pursue cooperative energy ownership and governance to avoid displacement and processes like gentrification. Um, so this brings me to the final two projects that 
I'll be talking about today um, that are within the distributed wind sector. And so just as a quick definition, distributed wind is a subsector within the wind energy in industry um, that is uh, wind energy connected at the distribution level of an electricity delivery system, or in some cases, off-grid applications to serve on-site energy demand or to serve local loads um, on the same distribution system. So the first distributed wind project that I'm involved in is called the Diverse and Equitable Workforce for Wind Project, or for short, DoWind. Um, we love acronyms at PNNL. PNNL is an acronym. Um, the problem context that necessitated DoWind as a project is twofold. The distributed wind industry is experiencing hiring difficulty and increased demand for a qualified workforce. The second part of the problem is that benefits and opportunities, another key theme here, uh, benefits and opportunities of the clean energy transition as far as job creations and workforce development aren't ac actionably aligned with diverse and equitable outcomes. And so Do Wind mobilizes addressing equity concerns by, prior to, by, by prioritizing partnering with minority serving institutions um, to develop a, ta uh, a talent pipeline into the distributed wind industry. And so the next distributed wind project that I work on is called SEND. SEND stands for um, strategize, looking at my slide here, because I don't have it in my notes, strategize, engage, network, and deploy distributed wind. Um, and so the objective of SEND is to use strategic and, and technical engagement to drive awareness and adoption of distributed wind, um, particularly in disadvantaged and underserved communities. Um, so distributed wind has the unique potential to address energy equity issues in rural and agricultural communities, um, such as increasing clean energy access um, and reducing energy burden or the amount of annual income that a household or a community spends on energy related expenses. Um, and in the spirit of partnerships and action, there's actually an opportunity to get involved and learn more about distributed wind through uh, the Department of Energy's new Distributed Wind Network and the Distributed Wind Resource Hub, shameless plug, um, through an upcoming webinar being held on March 14th. More details about that, anybody's interested in hearing. And so that takes me to the end of my presentation. Just want to say thank you to Beryl and Nicole for inviting me and also um, want to thank my PNNL colleagues that helped me put this presentation together, uh, Dr. Kendall Parker, Danielle, Danielle Prezuccio, and Camilla Kazmierchuk, just to name a few people. So yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, everybody. If there's any questions, you can say them. An amazing partner here. Uh, we were the one Georgia on his energy storage map here working. We are now moved to a phase two with Harambe House, where Harambe House will be the first community-owned resiliency hub here in the state of Georgia, mean by a community organization with the phase two of the battery storage. My question to you, because in our partnership when we first started, there was this learning curve from the lab side in terms of some of the things we talked about on the stage with processing and community. And when we got to the final report and I was reading, I recognized that they got it because the statement in the report was optimizing, mm -mm. when you have to make a decision around optimizing for the tech versus optimization for the social aspect of what the tech is trying to really get at. And it was a conversation that we've had with our team a lot that really began to shift even how they begin to think about not only this project, but just that optimization. If we're really trying to have this social impact, maybe the traditional ways that we've been thinking about the tech isn't enough. And so, Andrew, I just want to say to you, the PNNL team, for having the courage to listen and then take that back, because I don't think we would have gotten as far in our Georgia work to move on to phase two if you all did not listen. And so just thank you. And my question to you again, 
in terms of this techno optimization versus social, how can we get the engineers to understand that? How can we get those that are now in the decision-making power, the tools that incorporate, I know NREL is working on some amazing tools too that bring in more of this social aspect into the very technological analysis. Yeah, that's, thank you so much for your, um, the, the kind words, Dr. E, and that's also a really great question. Um, and I don't, I'm gonna preface by saying, I don't know if I have like a scalable like answer that can apply um, for, you know, all engineers that are interested or trying to do work that engages communities. Um, but I think how I can answer and what I can say is uh, what mattered for my own experience. Um, and I think there, there may be an answer to your question in there. Um, and I think that uh, it's actually gonna recall something from the earlier panel um, that I think probably you said as well too, so I may be stealing your own answer um, <laughs> to this question, but I think I, I, did, I think I did a couple things. So for me on my personal journey, um, I sort of had this like nagging feeling of there's something about my engineering education um, and you know technical economic analyses and uh, terms that you were talking about like optimization and efficiency and like all the the frameworks that come with that um, that way of like producing techno economic value uh, techno economic valuations that just seemed insufficient because if they worked, then like, how can we have, you know, this whole slew, this whole range of wicked problems um, that we face as a society? Um, and I mean, just within, you know, the energy and environmental sector, you know, how, if, if techno-economic valuations worked so well um, and they accounted for things so well and they were, you know, really great at being able to understand trade-offs and make decisions, how do we end up with um, runaway carbon emissions and ocean acidification and um, ocean pollution and all the different environmental issues that we have. And so for me, I think it took recognizing, me as someone who has an engineering degree and an engineering background, I think it took recognizing um, that there is a need um, for critical engagement, um, sometimes subjective engagement with these things that we understand to be very objective and scientific. Um, it took me being like, mm, well, there are things from my lived experience that I can bring in um, to understanding um, why certain things don't work in certain contexts. And I guess to like give, I'm trying to think of a concrete um, example to give, um, but I mean, yeah, just in the in the example that you gave, thinking about economic, techno-economic optimization versus optimization for resilience, um, I think it takes, you know, coming out of like the ideal model paper on the situation and listening to people, listening to people and understanding, okay, we understand that like, yes, we want to optimize for these things and this is what the model is telling us, but we know that when we apply it in the real world, this is going to be insufficient because people have these needs, these goals, these desires that this solution, designing for this solution is not going to meet. And so I think the thing that you were talking about is sort of the duration of energy that a battery can provide. Um, and whether it's, you know, an eight hour outage versus a 24 hour outage. And knowing that like, okay, we get that, we can look at national data and see that most outages don't last for more than eight hours. But it's like, okay, when, when you start looking at that data in other ways and taking a critical lens to that data, you start seeing that outages in low income black and brown communities can be really, really long. And then when they're really disastrous, they start becoming these huge outliers that can totally shift data sets. And so I think it takes, you know, taking that critical lens um, to understanding what a model outputs um, and adding in that, that lived experience um, to, to develop something that probably meets in the middle. That was probably a really long roundabout answer to that question, but that's what I have for that. Hi, Andrew. Um, that was wonderful. I'm Ruthie. 
<clears throat> I work at SCORE, the Center for Sustainable Communities Research and Education, um, and there's so much I want to ask you about. Um, that was so rich. But could you talk a little bit about the way that you use or think about qualitative methods? For example, when you were working um, on your infrastructure project and you were talking to the folks of Faith Pen, Faith's Pen. Yeah, Faith's Pen. Yeah, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, so um, I, uh, and this is something I feel like I fight a battle with every day working at p and um, and working with a team of people who are natural scientists and traditional engineers is that um, qualitative data and qualitative methods are just as critical as like the quantitative data and methods. Um, and so some of the things that my, my research in Jamaica um, taught me, or some of the things that I, I started to learn how to use were methods like semi-structured interviews, um, going and asking people questions that can then be translated and speak to um, things that, or, or ideas or concepts that um, folks who are considered like traditional stakeholders that make key decisions about projects, um, taking those perspectives and translating them, like getting them through the interviews and translating them to critique the, the narratives um, and the discourse that uh, decision makers at national and international levels um, make about projects. And so, yeah, semi-structured interviews um, was the method that I took or that I used in my field work um, in Jamaica and Today in my work um, in the sort of Triple EJ space at PNNL, um, I always try and find ways to have conversations with folks that can contextualize and, and bring a level of humanity um, to data that it is that I'm looking at, whether that's data coming from the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index or the EPA's EJ screen, Environmental Justice Screening Tool. Um, Figuring out, okay, I get, I can see this data about particulate matter. I can see this data about um, energy burden, but how, what does that mean, and how does that actually show up in people's day-to-day -day experiences um, through questions, through conversations, through qualitative methods? So then, actually, design a solution or approach um, that not just moves the needle on the numbers, but also moves the needle on people's experiences. Um, and the way they interact and in, uh, interface with infrastructure. Hello? I'm sorry. <laughs> Very shy. But um, I have a quick question. I was really interested in kind of what you talked about, the background uh, with Houston, Atlanta, and Jamaica. So I was wondering, you talked about just clean energy. So I was wondering kind of how you thought about that nationally compared to internationally, like what that looks like across regions and how that like fits into your work. It's more about asking you to expand a little bit about what you talked about. Like what does just clean energy look like and how you build in your processes when you talk about things outside the US national context compared to international context? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think one of the key things that I learned, again, from my political ecology studies is that um, a just clean energy transition on an international scale um, requires systemic change um, that doesn't involve uh, just extracting different resources for different purposes. So through this process called colonization, um, there are global capital flows that were established between the way that geographers sort of um, understand the world to be the global south and the global north. The global south being like the global majority world, um, places that people might refer to as developing or middle and low income countries, and then the global north being um, your usual suspects, the United States, um, Europe, highly modernized, industrialized societies. Um, so a just clean energy transition on an international scale means not saying that like, oh, the global north who has essentially and for all intents and purposes caused climate change and now needs to solve it um, by transitioning to clean energy instead of um, carbon producing energy. 
um, the solution to that is using the same pathways that were established um, from colonization to keep extracting the resources that the global north needs um, to solve the problems to keep extracting resources from the global south that the global north needs to solve global problems that the global north created. Um, and so a just clean energy transition in that, in that facet means um, putting the burden of who caused climate change, um, putting that burden on the folks who caused climate change to solve climate change in a way that doesn't reproduce the same harms of, of subjugation and, and marginalization. Um, and so I guess to give like really concrete and timely and specific examples, um, you know, rare earth metals um, are in so many of the pro products that we use today. Everybody probably has a product on them right now that uses rare earth metals. Um, and in order to uh, approach a decarbonization pathway, um, we're gonna need more rare earth metals for things like turbines and solar panels. Um, and so, and batteries, yeah. <laughs> um, and so moving to those products um, from a justice-oriented perspective um, means you know, not using um, enslaved labor and child labor um, in places like the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, to establish the supply chains um, that create our clean energy technologies. Um, and it also means um, countries in the global north, like the US, the UK, um, you know, paying um, for the, paying and, and really putting up the, the financial capital that they need to in order to uh, deal with climate change in a way that doesn't recreate um, those same burdens on places like the DRC around the world. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, any other questions or? Yeah, thank you for uh, this talk. I thought it was a really amazing work, and I'm, I'm glad you get to do this professionally. Uh, I, I know there's probably people who are trying to do things like this and not getting paid for it. Uh, so I guess my question then is, you know, being from Atlanta and thinking about Atlanta, are there people doing that work here um, in the same way, I guess, that, that you're able to do? And if not, how do we get that to, I guess, uh, be a little more centered here. You know, I always think of Atlanta really as being poised to be the next clean energy hub, especially for the Southeast, you know, to be a leader in that space. And so I would love to hear your thoughts on sort of that ecosystem here. Yeah, there are definitely organizations um, in Atlanta that are leading um, the, the move towards a just clean energy transition. Um, organizations, community-based organizations like Dr. E's IECA Solutions. Um, another organization that comes to mind um, is Dana Claire Redden's um, Solar Stewards. Um, they're, they're a whole network of um, community-based, community-engaged, community-empowering organizations um, that are thinking about the same concepts that I talked about here today, um, here within the Southeast, trying to figure out how to, how to navigate the really sort of hostile legislative um, environment that is the Southeast, um, uh, legislative and regulatory environment, um, figuring out how to, again, going back to that pillar of distributive justice, ensure, ensure that the benefits um, that a lot of, uh, the clean energy transition has to offer our reaching um, marginalized communities, low income, uh, BIPOC communities. Um, and so those are the only two that I can think of off the top of my head right now, um, but there are definitely more that you know, we can stay in touch and I can let you know um, what organizations are, are sort of operation, operationalizing and mobilizing the clean energy transition here in Atlanta and within the Southeast as a region. Another question. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question regarding to the one of the, the examples which you had. Uh, re, this highway, what would you do if you were the manager? Would you not order the highway to be built or what would you do? 
Um, that's, a, that's a great question. This highway is a very complicated, complex thing in that um, Jamaica first tries to get this highway built like back in the 1970s. Um, they went to the World Bank, they went to the IMF, they went to like every Euro Western institution um, and colonial relationship that they had um, to try and build, um, to try and finance and construct this highway. I think in a way that would serve Jamaica. Um, and so because of, um, because of concepts and things like austerity um, and legacies of colonization and disenfranchisement um, and being put in a place of like manufactured economic dependency, um, Jamaica wasn't able to construct this highway, I think essentially on their terms. Um, and that led to um, the highway, I think, being constructed under terms that weren't necessarily agreeable. Um, so the way that <laughs> the way that I would solve the problem um, is to get a time travel machine and keep Christopher Columbus from ever discovering America. Um, <laughs> but that's not <laughs> that's not um, you know a super viable pathway. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I have an answer to that question because I do think that countries like Jamaica um, deserve to have infrastructure that serves them, um, infrastructure that can reconfigure geographies for the betterment and improvement of the communities along that highway. And I think that it would have just involved um, not just engaging those communities, but empowering those communities to be a part of the highway design, implementation, and execution process um, because there's so many examples in the way that that highway was executed where it could have gone in different routes, it could have um, not been a toll road, for example. <laughs> um, there are lots of different ways that the highway could have been executed better. Yeah, not, not to give like a blunt, I guess, answer to that question, but I think one way to have approached a better solution was to maybe evaluate whether or not a highway was the right solution. Maybe it could have been um, you know, a free railway system that you know, gets people in between the North and South Coast uh, where folks don't have to pay in order to access it and it's also a form of, of mass transit. We can start then getting into, okay, well, how come light rail isn't in a lot of other places across the world? And I think that that could lead to a whole other series of questions. But I think the thing is, is um, that the highway is missing was the sort of critical engagement um, with the communities that are affected by the highway. Um, it was a process that was sort of divorced from the people who use the highway and the people who experience and interact with the highway. So yeah. I think we're a bit over time, but I will let one last question. <laughs> um, and then we can close up and ask more, talk to Drew after as well. <laughs> That to me was critical, and it was a beautiful way to describe that assessment that you get on the ground. Um, and one thought that I had about the problem that was raised was we have a lot of procedural things that we can do to prevent negative outcomes. For example, to prevent an explosion, you have procedural things to make sure things are clean and wipe off the dust and whatever. So is there something procedural or policy that could be implemented if they are installing this infrastructure that is intended to improve but ca causes these gaps? Um, in Atlanta, we had the highways that just divided all of the communities that were here, and the Beltline brought that back to us. Mm. Um, could there be something like a restriction? For, for example, in London, there's a restriction on driving downtown, you just, you can't. Yeah. Uh, so only, only trucks or only taxis get to the news, and the news is the highway taxis get to the news of the highway. Are there things like that that are considered or that would be feasible considering all of the other structures, political, social, cultural? Um, 
Yes, I think the things that come to mind are, that you're speaking to are definitely um, ways to promote procedural justice, procedural equity, and um, although some of the things that you, you asked about, I don't, I don't wanna try and diminish or, or make them seem like they're not complex or complicated, um, but some of the things that immediately come to mind that I think can alleviate or mitigate some of those procedural inequities are like making sure that all the, the actors, like if we were to do like a network analysis of like who this project will influence and affect, like does everybody within this network have access to the same information? Um, because then that can, information can empower people to be a part of the decision making process. Um, going back to the earlier question and say like, hey, maybe we should vote on whether or not this highway has 10 exits or whether it has 20 exits. Um, maybe or not we should vote on whether or not uh, this highway um, goes through this community um, and, uh, or whether or not it bifurcates you know, this other community. Um, I think people having access um, and reducing information asymmetries between people that are uh, among a network um, can help achieve some of those procedural justices that I think you were striking at. Well, thank you so much. Um, and like I said, Drew will be around for a bit, so feel free to catch him after and ask more questions. But um, yeah, thank you. It's been really great. Um, really appreciate you coming.